You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest tea spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute. And if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, just go and give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram. Or you can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. OMG, are you ready? It is the Girardi deep dive part two. A lot has been covered since part one. I hope you have your no filter wine ready. And if not, you need to go to nofilterwine.com and order some of this delicious, light, crisp, lightly fizzy rose. Perfect for the summer. Tiny, you can take it around, but it still packs a punch. It's got 12.8% alcohol, which is amazing, but it has less than a gram of sugar, so you're not going to get that gnarly wine headache. All right, are you ready? Because we're going to do a Girardi deep dive part two today. I have my uh, I Stole Kim's Goddamn House. That's the wine that I'm drinking today because um, Tom Girardi may have stolen that too. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about today? So if you, first of all, if you haven't watched the Deep Dive Part 1, which came out a couple of, a few months ago, I want to say maybe like back in like January is when the, is when Part 1 came out. And that was like when, that was really kind of the background information on all of the previous cases that Tom had, or the, the clients and the cases that Tom had allegedly taken advantage of. We talked about Boeing. We talked about all these other victims that had been trying to get money from Tom. This deep dive is going to go deep into Tom Girardi and the scheme that he had been playing for a really long time. Like, let me just show you my notes. Like, look at this. Boom, 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 boom. Look at how long, look at how long. That is so many notes, so many notes. If you're watching this on the YouTube, you can see the notes. But if you're listening to this like on iTunes or Spotify or something, thank you. Please make sure you subscribe. But you, the full experience is always on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash just plain Zach. OK, so what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to talk about Tom Girardi and the scheme and how long how long ago it actually goes. We're going to talk about how he was actually getting away with all of this, because the biggest question we all had was like, how was his law license not revoked? And who are the players that were protecting him? We're going to get into all of that because there are multiple. It's a whole thing. What else are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about his ex-wife. We're going to talk about the business that he had in place and how his ex-wife kind of blew the lid on that. But yet it didn't actually go anywhere and it didn't actually shut his practice down. It just kept him. It, I mean, it kept him probably pivoting his strategy moving forward and how that's going to affect Erica Jane. We're going to talk about the state of California. We're going to talk about the state bar and how they really jacked up this whole mess and ended up screwing all of these families in the process of it. And are they wrong, though? Was it their fault? Was it the state's fault? Was it the bar's fault? We're going to break down all of that because um, there's a lot of finger pointing. We're going to talk about Erica Jane and her book, The Pretty Mess. I went back and I went through the book. I took lots of notes. We're going to cover everything that's in it. We're going to cover the incriminating parts that's in it because there's a lot of information in it. And some things that she says, I have quotes. Some of them are not that pretty. They definitely are a mess, though. Then we're going to talk about Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and what she's saying on the show, what she actually knew, how much that actually matters. And then we're going to be talking about Ronald Richards. And the, that whole mess, because I just feel like we're not talking about that enough. And that's like a big, you know, Ronald McDonald clown mess that we need to actually start to talk about and start to address. And now we're going to mention it. And then we're going to talk about the victims and like what happens to them now and what's likely going to happen. And then later this week on Wednesday, I have Emily D. Baker back on the show and she's going to be answering all of the follow-up questions to this deep dive. And we're going to get into really just kind of her professional opinion about a lot of these things. A lot of you guys brought some really good cases, some really good theories, some really good questions. So all of those will be asked of Emily D. Baker. She'll be back on the show this Wednesday. Um, but all right, let's 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 dive in. Okay. Let's start with the scheme that Tom Girardi actually had in place. So based off of my research, because I'm like, I don't know if I'm more Al Woods or more Kim Kardashian, but I had my all my little books ready and I was taking lots of notes. But it looks like this case. And here, one thing that I do think, because, you know, I always like to shout out my resources, Law 360 um, had published a three-part series on their website. 
that's really good that dives into a lot of this. And so I'm a lot of the information that I pulled for today's deep dive came from those articles and a lot of the other articles that they've published in the past. They're a really good resource and I highly recommend you actually sign up for them. I mean, they're they're a little more in depth and I had to like reread some of the articles a little bit and take a little more notes and try to, you know, look up a few legal terms, but you can get through it. And so if you really want to dive deep beyond the information presented here today, I recommend it because there's a lot more information that is actually in those articles. Um, and, and we'll go through all, all the other additional resources because there's there's a lot. So it looks like Tom Girardi, all of this mess, I originally thought, my original theory was it was a snowball. And there was probably one case that he borrowed a little bit of money from. And then, you know, it kind of got out of hand. He had to take out some loans to pay it back. His spending was probably a little too much. He wasn't able to quickly pay back those loans. Maybe he didn't win the next lawsuit right away. And eventually it just kind of got bigger and bigger. And he had to keep dipping into clients' money and had to keep borrowing money from them to afford his lifestyle and to keep up appearances. And it just kind of fell out of his hands very organically. And it was unintentional. It was an unintentional mess that was created. That does not appear to be the case after what I found out recently. This was pre this seemingly is premeditated. And again, I also want to preface with the disclaimer, nothing presented in this episode is meant to like incriminate Tom Girardi or Erica Girardi or anybody else mentioned. I'm merely a, a podcaster, journalist, news outlet presenting a highly publicized case. There's nothing that is intended to incriminate anybody. Just want to make sure I put that out there. I'm not trying to defame anybody's character. I'm not trying to ruin anybody's reputation or their business or anybody affiliated with them. Merely throwing out the information that I found and presenting the data. Okay, so Tom Girardi should have been reported dating back to the the 90s. I thought after he won the Aaron Brockovich case, that's where it was going to be. That's where he kind of got the fame. He got the recognition. And then it was like, oh, I need to maintain this appearance as a powerful lawyer. And I think I actually say that like, that's what I thought in the, the first part of the deep dive, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So he should have been reported back in the 90s pre Aaron Brockovich. And I believe there's actually an article in Salon from the early 2000s that goes into how some of the money from the Aaron Brockovich case doesn't appear to have been paid out either. So I, how that slipped through the crack, through the cracks, considering there was like a movie and there were so many other pieces that, you know, that was, to me, that's just like that, a highly publicized case that if people weren't getting paid, I would have thought there would have been a further investigation into all of that. But it seemed like, it seems like what Tom was doing was he was intentionally jumping through these loopholes within the legal system that basically led the California State Bar to that prevented them from catching on to the fact that he was cheating the system. And so if there was a loophole, he found it and he exploited it and used it to his advantage. And it looks like there were up to about 91 instances since 1990 where he could have been where there could have been action taken from the state bar against Tom Girardi and it wasn't 91 is a really strong number that number comes from the first the first article in the series from law 360 and there were apparently 45 lawsuits that were alleging that he has stolen money from clients per law 360 45 lawsuits where clients said, I didn't get all of my settlement. You didn't give all of my... So this is more than just, you know, the Boeing plane crash with the orphans and the widows. This is more than just the Rui Gomez family that we saw in the Hulu documentary, The Housewife and the Hustler. This goes way deeper than that. Those are two highly publicized cases. And I think I covered a few more, not... I don't think I even covered like 10 cases. I know I talked about like the senior citizens. There are, you know, a lot of like, you know, chemical... um, poisoning cases. A lot of those, I I think I covered a few of them in the first part of the deep dive, but 45 lawsuits, like that's huge. 45 lawsuits alleging that he claimed that he had taken money from clients. 54 lawsuits altogether. That's crazy. And I believe most of them were either settled, dropped, like he really wasn't persecuted for any of that. So now how does a lawyer like Tom Girardi in Los Angeles get all of these, get 54 lawsuits filed against him from former clients and get away with it? So 
this is where we look at the state bar. So with the state bar, the way the system is currently set up, lawyers have to report themselves if there's any misconduct. So if I'm a lawyer, hypothetically speaking, if I'm a lawyer and I do something bad, I'm the one that's then responsible to go to the state bar and said, oopsie, whoopsie, I did something bad. You need to, you need to, you know, take action against me. You need to reprimand me. You need to discipline me because I've been a very, very bad boy. That's what lawyers have to do. They have to self-report. They have to report themselves to the bar. In my head, when I found that, I was like, well, how many lawyers are actually going to be like, oopsie, whoopsie, I stole some client money. Let me go tell on myself. Based off of, you know, the information that's out there, Tom Girardi only reported himself to the state bar one time in a case that had already been publicized where he basically, there was no way to avoid reporting it. And if he did report it, that would probably seem like a red flag. So he reported himself to be like, I'm a good guy. As he said in the voicemails and the housewife and the hustler, I'm a good guy. Are you though, Tom Girardi? Are you really a good guy? We're all looking at you. We all want to melt the ice queen, but I'm looking at you, Tom Girardi. I'm looking at you out to lunch with your travel agent and your possible pretend amnesia, okay? I'm not hoping you drive yourself into another ding-dong ditch, but, like, I'm not not hoping that either. Okay, so now we know that lawyers have to report themselves. And usually if you're a shady lawyer, like, you know, are you really going to report yourself? Probably not. Now, let's look at the banks because the banks are also responsible. So the way the California State Bar has it set up is where they know that lawyers that are shady are probably not going to be reporting themselves. So what they have are all these other barriers. And surprisingly, California is one of the is the one state in the in our country that actually handles this system the best. And other states have now kind of adopted similar guidelines or ways to kind of find the shady lawyers without the self reporting. So the other one of the other ways that the bar tries to track if a lawyer is being shady is they track they have the bank track for overdraft trust overdrafts. So usually when there's a when settlement money comes in, it goes into a trust account, right? So the banks that usually hold the trust accounts, they have to monitor that. And if there are any overdrafts within the trust account, they have to report that to the state bar as saying, hey, this doesn't sound right. There's an overdraft in this trust account from a settlement that was supposed to go to a client. So banks are supposed to report any overdraft that happens with those accounts. Trust accounts are where, you know, the money is placed when a settlement from a client for a client is reached. Tom, however, didn't have a single trust account. Tom Girardi had multiple accounts from more than one bank, including his own checking account. So that's why there wouldn't have been any red flags for any uh, overdrafts because the money was moving through many different channels. The money was going over here and go, and some of it was going into this account and some of it was being taken from that account. And then his, you have his, per, his checking account that's also being added into it and the bank's not going to be monitoring that. The bank's monitoring the trust account, not his checking account. So if you can't, if you don't have, the, you can't have an overdraft reported if there's no overdraft because the money's moving around. Smart man, that's one tough cookie. That's one smart cookie, Tom Girardi. Okay, so aside from self-reporting and aside from the bank overdrafts, the next way that the, the state bar accepts complaints is from insurance companies. So they have to report every lawsuit. So insurers have an obligation to report any lawyer that gets sued for malpractice or misappropriation of funds or fraud. So anytime a lawyer does anything shady and is not willing to report himself or herself, then the insurance companies that that provide that liability coverage to the law firm or to the individual lawyers, anytime a lawsuit comes up, they have to report it to the state bars and, oh, this uh, this lawyer got sued by this client for this amount of money. And here's, you know, just letting you know what's going on and the accusations that were made against that lawyer. Tom Girardi never had any professional liability insurance, which is quite odd and quite uncommon for a firm as large as Girardi Keys, but if you don't have insurance, then you don't have an insurer that's going to report you. So he was handling, so it, he didn't even have to worry about insurance covering these lawsuits because he was too busy trying to settle them on his own and seemingly being successful at it because 
40, 54 lawsuits that he was able to kind of move past undetected from the state bar. He was pretty good at his job. If you don't have a watchdog to watch you, then you don't have anyone to to watch you do anything bad. Only you. It's just you. Two can keep a secret if one of them is dead, right? Lesson we learned from Pretty Little Liars. So, excuse me, I need to take a sip of water. Um, ah, Tom Girardi's making me thirsty like Erica Jane back in the late 90s. There were several instances where Tom would have had to have reported himself because there were lawsuits that were filed against him. Usually that's an instance where you're like, oh, okay, this means I did something bad. I don't have an insurance company. So me being a good, honest, ethical lawyer, I'm going to report myself because this client is trying to sue me. Well, it appears, shocker, he didn't report himself for any of those lawsuits. Now, when a judge sanctions a lawyer for more than $1,000 in a lawsuit, that's when the judge then is responsible for reporting for fi- uh, filing a report to the state bar. So outside of the insurance companies, obviously the the judge is the one who's also overseeing these cases. Well, as long if the judgment is more than a thousand dollars, and the lawyer is responsible for paying that back to the client or whoever is is uh, suing the lawyer, then the judge has to report that. Well. Tom, being the little magician that he is, was just pulling rabbits out of every hat he could get. He was pulling, you know, rabbits out of all of Erica Jane's little fancy hats that she was doing Erica Jane with. So many of the clients that came after Tom, this is where it gets real shady. So a lot of those clients were claiming that they never had access to their financial documents, which means they don't even know exactly how much money they want in their settlements aside from what Tom told them. His word was all they had. So hypothetical, because this isn't an actual case, but let's say Tom Girardi wins a case for, uh, you know, Joy Coy over there. And he's like, hey, Joy Coy, you won $5 million. And she's like, okay, cool. And he's like, I'm going to put it into a trust account. I'm going to invest it for you. I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do to, you know, make sure you get your money and we maximize it or whatever he told jo- jo- uh, Joy Coy. Okay. For all we know, Joy Coy could have won a $20 million settlement, but Tom Girardi didn't tell her that. And so when she would then go to, when then she would hypothetically, if jo- Joy Coy would take Tom Girardi to court to sue him for the $5 million that he said she won, she wouldn't necessarily be able to prove that because not only did she not have the financial documents, but she had no documentation that would be able to verify what the settlement actually was, which is highly unethical because the client, the the um, the person that's actually entitled to the settlement, that's the person that's supposed to decide what they want to what they want to settle for. What the amount, you know, obviously your lawyer is more of the broker that kind of helps liaison the deal, but the lawyer is not the one making the decisions. The client is. The lawyer is just acting as the middleman to help negotiate, to help you get the best you can get. Tom Girardi wasn't listening to his clients, though. He was acting on behalf of his clients and doing things. Well, it sounds more like he was acting on behalf of himself. So, if you don't have the documents with the actual number, how do you know what you're actually suing Tom Girardi for other than, you know, the number that he gave you or what he actually said? So a judge couldn't really sanction him for anything because the discovery process never really came to fruition. And the discovery process is where he would have to provide those financial documents, which a lot of the time he didn't do, or he would bury, you know, he would bury the lead in tons and tons of documents with unnecessary paperwork or jumbled data, I think is the way uh, Law 360 explained it. Basically, he would abuse the discovery process, and if there was no discovery process or it never really came to fruition, then there was no way to even have the lawsuit move forward, and that's why you see a lot of these clients either dropping the cases or just settling him w- with him outside of court where he'd be like, okay, I'll pay you, and we'll, we'll work something out, because a lot of the cases ended up being, he ended up settling outside of court, so there was nothing for the judge to report, because one, the judge didn't even know the number, and then... He worked it out with the client, so there was no need to move it forward. So then the judges didn't need to actually report him to the state bar either. So it just left most of the clients just settling with Tom directly and not moving forward with the suit. Now let's introduce Tom's ex-wife. 
Kathy Reisner. Kathy Reisner Girardi, but I believe now she's just Kathy Reisner. And I'd, we need to find Kathy Reisner. We need to put a missing persons alert for her because there's not a lot of information about her on the internet. There's a lot of information about Erica Jane, but there's nothing about Kathy Reisner, and I want to take her out for a drink. So Kathy Reisner, she married Tom in 1993, filed for divorce um, and separated from Tom in 1998. So they were only together for, what, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. Wow, they were only together for five years. That's not a lot of time. They finally settled their divorce in, I believe, 2003, which is three years after he married married Erica because he married Erica in January of 2000. So it took him a minute to actually settle that divorce. Why is this important and how does this relate to the state bar? Well, in their divorce settlement... Kathy testified against Tom in 2002 in an attempt to get herself some of that spousal support where she claimed in her testimony that Tom would brag and laugh about abusing the discovery process in court. Kathy said this under oath that Tom would laugh about being able to take advantage of the discovery process, which is where he would have to fork over those those financial documents for the clients in court, which is how he would squeeze his way out of these lawsuits. And so Kathy was like, screw this. I don't know him anything. He doesn't even want to pay me spousal support. Like at this point, you're going down Tom Girardi. And you would have thought this would have taken him down if the wife is coming out and saying these things. Like this was his, like you would think that would be more important. But the other really interesting piece of that, like yes, it's big that Kathy's admitting that in court. But for me, the really big like smoking gun in her testimony aside from the state bar is the fact that he was talking to his wife and he was sharing details of this scheme that he was allegedly running to rip off his clients or at least de- like pieces of this scheme which tells me Kathy knew a lot about what Tom was doing Kathy was only married for- to him for what less than 5 years Kathy probably caught on to what was happening, wanted to exit and was like, I don't want to be a part of any of this, you know, blood money mission. I don't know how much of it she actually knew, but at least from her testimony, it tells us she knew that he was willing to abuse the court system. Now, he may have told her that these were, you know, bitter clients trying to rip him off. Like he may have sold her some cheap story to make him look good. But the fact that he was talking to her and bragging about his antics in court, that that reveals, that says a lot, you know? It says that he was talking to his wife, which doesn't really look good for Erica Jane. But at the same time, I'm also like, well, to play devil's advocate a little bit, if he was talking to Kathy and then Kathy in the divorce went and used that against him, Tom's a pretty smart and savvy man. And if Kathy went and testified under oath against him to say to talk about his shady dealings in court, I highly doubt, I think at that point, he would take, you know, a lesson out of that book and be like, yeah, I don't think my next wife is going to know anything. I don't think I'm going to tell her anything because I've already been burned by my last two wives. So I, I think the third wife at that point is really just the younger the younger eye candy. But I mean, it was interesting how he also jumped very quickly from Kathy to Erica because he, in 1999, started dating Erica, knew Erica for a minute, but started dating her in 99, married her in 2000. So less than two years after your wife, your ex-wife files for divorce, you're already moving on to the next one. I mean, but I guess that's what, what men like Tom Girardi do. They're like, I don't care. I just want my next, my cute gold digging blonde to come and sit on my arm. Kathy's since been keeping a very low profile since she, you know, got her since her divorce was finally settled in 2003. There really isn't anything about her on the Internet. I mean, even on and I know that Wikipedia is not like a credible source, but even on his Wikipedia page, they have the dates from when he was married to his first wife and then the dates when he was married to Erica, when he married Erica to when she filed for divorce. But when it comes to Kathy, there's not even they like the timeline of their relationship isn't even all there. The only way, you know, I was able to find that is because it's in like, you know, their their divorce documents that I went through. And there's a lot in those divorce documents. Um, but basically the main point is that and we'll get to the other points, but the main point is that he was talking to Kathy. And I don't think he was talking to Erica because of the way Kathy burned him in court in the divorce settlement. 
Now, the divorce documents also reveal that there were very there were multiple large loans that were given out to many other individuals. Individuals like Johnny Cochran, who you'll remember from like the O.J. Simpson trials. Why would Johnny Cochran be needing a loan, a large loan from Tom Girardi? We're talking like, you know, some of these were like multi-million dollar loans, which is also interesting because now a lot of people are talking about the 20 million or the 20 to 25. That's the estimated 20 to 25 million loan that was apparently given to Erica Jane or to the Eric and Jane business. It was given to Erica Girardi. So everyone's focusing on that and they're all coming after Erica because obviously that's a very large loan. This came up in Kathy's divorce to Tom because my understanding is she brought it up because she wanted money from Tom. And if Tom was trying to claim that he didn't have money, she was like, no, hold up, wait a minute. He gave X number of dollars to Johnny Cochran over there and he gave it to Johnny Cochran while I was married to him. So I'm entitled to half of that Johnny Cochran loan because they pulled up all of like the tax filings and all to find out like what Tom, what money Tom Girardi actually had. So I think there was a lot that happened in his divorce from Kathy and a lot of the same mistakes I don't think he would be willing to make with Erica Jane. However, the whole loan situation, I mean, at first I was like, wait, why would Johnny need a loan? Like, why would Johnny need cash? And did he need cash? And why would he get it from Tom Girardi? So now it is possible that the that these loans weren't actually real loans. I mean, obviously, I don't think anybody believes that they were an actual loan loan, but it's possible that they were just entirely fabricated or fake and a potentially a way to write off for tax purposes or possibly even a way to like hide and move money around. And we'll get into like the multiple businesses that he owned and how that was all kind of shady later on when we get to Erica Jane. But it's possible that Homeboy was really just trying to make it seem like he was giving these people loans and that may not have actually been the case. It may have just been a way to be like, oops, I can write that off the books. Oops, I don't have to pay taxes on, you know, that 10 mil over there. Like what, like how is he even in a position to be lending people all of this money like that? Because to me, it's like if I give, you know, 10 bucks to Joe down the street, or if I say, if I write, you know, in my tax returns that I gave 10 bucks to Joe down the street, but I didn't actually give $10 to Joe down the street, I get to that, that $10 can be written off, but I could then still have it in my bank account and spend it freely. It's a possibility. It's a theory. It's out there that it's possible that these loans weren't actually real loans and they were just tax write-offs for him. So it's possible that that loan to EJ Global never actually went to EJ Global. That he, I mean, I'm sure he was paying for all of the Glam Squad and all of that, but it's possible that that wasn't being paid through EJ Global. It could have just been pay, been paid through Tom directly and... You know, that'll be a big question later on down the line of like, well, where, so if the 20 million doesn't act, actually exist, then how, one, how do we prove that? And is Erica still responsible if she never even received that 20 million? Like that's going to get messy down the line, but that's the investigation that Ronald Richards is trying to find. But that is a possibility that I have heard that these loans may not actually exist, that they were just write-offs, which is wild to me. But it seemed like it was a way for him to kind of shuffle and move around money, hide money, conceal money. Like aside from him being able to jump through all the loopholes at the state bar, his other art was really the art of hiding money, which also leads me to believe that I don't think he actually lost all of the money that he claimed to have lost in court recently, where he said he only had 15000 in cash. Now I'm really thinking... No, homeboy, you have the money. The money is somewhere. There is a big pot of money and it's somewhere and we're going to need to find it at some point because you owe people a lot of money. I don't care if it's in your mattress. I don't care if it's in your garage. I don't care if it's in, you know, a pot of gold hit, dug up in the backyard. I don't care if you drove and drove off the damn clip and into the ding dog ditch that you can go and hide it down there. We're going to find the money. The money, I'm pretty sure at this point, the money wasn't spent because that was another part of my original theory was that theory was that he just had such lavish, like such a lavish lifestyle that he was trying to present 
that, you know, maybe he really did lose the money because he was taking out all these really high interest loans from lenders, which are which is where a lot of these lawsuits are coming from more than it's coming from the victims. It's coming from lenders that gave Tom loans and now they want the loans back because he was promising them that the money was going to come in so he could pay them back. Guess what? He never ended up paying them back. Another really wild, interesting theory, but I no longer believe that he just spent all the money. I really believe he was trying to cheat people and has hidden a lot of the money or at least a good chunk of the money. Knowing that you've been doing this shady shit for so many years and knowing that at some point it really could come down and get you. We'll see if Erica's loan was actually given to her or not. There are a lot of people in play with all of this. Like Erica Jane is just one of many, many, many people that were either given loans or were listed in some of these other businesses that he had, which now are just seemingly shell companies that he was using to kind of move and conceal the money. But he did have multiple businesses like Girardi Financial. That's the one that Erica was listed as being a secretary on. And everyone's like, oh, well, she's listed in that. That must be incriminating. But it could have just been that those weren't even real businesses, that they were really just another attempt to move the money around. And they were shell companies that didn't actually do anything. And that people like Erica were really just seat fillers that were listed in the paperwork. Because if the company isn't actually doing if Girardi Financial doesn't actually do anything, then what would she be a secretary of? She wouldn't be secretary in anything because she didn't actually have a role because there was no actual business. It was all just a front for him to be able to hide and conceal money and to continue to give off all of these loans. And I'm telling you, there were a lot of people involved in these cases. It was not just Erica Jane. And I assume that the businesses will be the next investigation. Right now, they're investigating Erica because obviously she's the wife. She has a lot of marital community property that they want to liquidate to pay people. But I assume that there is probably already an investigation going into all these other companies like Girardi Financial at this point. So how was Tom able to get away with all of this? This is where we get more. This is where we get deeper into the bar, the California State Bar. So aside from all of these loopholes that he was jumping through, he was in a lot of pockets. He had a lot of ties to a lot of officials at the state bar, not to not just the state bar, but like he was also making many political contributions to some very powerful people. We have California Governor Newsom, Gavin Newsom, who went on Watch What Happens Live and talked about how Erica Jane is his favorite housewife because her husband has made many contributions to his campaign. And guess who else's campaign he made a lot of contributions to? Joe Dunn. Who's Joe Dunn? Joe Dunn is former executive director of the California State Bar. His campaign received many financial contributions from Mr. Tom Girardi. So it sounds like Tom Girardi really wanted Joe Dunn at the state bar. He even made, I don't know if there's anything to it, but he even made a lot of like uh, political contributions to Joe Biden. Now, wealthy people make political contributions all the time. It's a little different when you're making contributions to the California governor and to the executive director of the California state bar that's supposed to be reprimanding shady lawyers and you're a shady lawyer. Hmm. Sounds like a bit of a coinky dink that's not so much of a coinky dink. He, I mean, I'm, Joe Dunn was also like seemingly very close to Tom and to the Girardi Keys firm because he even vacationed with Howard Miller, who's Tom's partner. Um, Joe Dunn was later reported for unethical breaches. He tried to dispute those, but, it, you know, there was also Tom Latin. Tom Latin is a former bar investigator, but he was also a really close friend of Tom Girardi's, and Tom Girardi was very supportive of Tom. There was a whole LA Times article that seemed to suggest that Tom Latin was had a really big role in turning the other cheek at the state bar because he's the investigator. You have the executive director and then you have the investigator that are your friends. And I would assume, you know, it'd be very easy for them to turn the other cheek. I'm not accusing them of doing that, but I'm just saying I can see how it would be easy to do that when you have somebody that you are going on vacation with and that you're going out with very often and that you have a close relationship with and that has made a lot of financial contributions. Just saying... But again, there were no reports filed against Tom at the state bar, at least none that stuck. There were no sanctions against him. There were no, there was no, um, there was, there were no consequences to Tom Girardi. Now, 
The state bar, however, did have a reckoning. I believe they had a whole kind of restructuring of their system back in 2018, where they ended up cutting loose Joe Dunn and Tom Latin, along with a few others. And they kind of were like, okay, we need to we need to straighten things out at the state bar. And so that there was that sort of restructuring where we cut them loose. But now it's a mat now that the case has become so highly publicized with Tom Girardi. I mean, it's it's interesting to even say case because there are multiple cases. So it's more of like the Tom Girardi scandal now that there's like, you know, it's got the attention of ABC News and it's got the attention of Hulu and everybody's talking about it. And, you know, it's it's highly it's heavily covered on hashtag no filter with Zach Peter. Now the state and the bar are like, hold up, wait a minute, what's going on? So the state bar or sorry. Yeah, this, no, the state of California is jumping in and they're like, yo, bar, you effed up. And then the bar said, hold up, wait a minute, um, we couldn't keep up with all of these cases and go after somebody like Tom Girardi because you, state, aren't giving us enough money. Now, fork up some cash. We're like, Erica Jane, and we need your money, Tom, okay? Then the state said, uh, no way, Jose. We looked at your books and all those little fancy dinners, all those entertainment write-offs, all those Tiffany gifts that you're giving to your employees, Mm, sounds like you aren't putting the money to good use. So we're going to cut it. We're going to cut your budget and we're going to cut you. And then the bar's like, no, 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 no. I need that money like Brandy Glanville. I need the cash. I am an enigma wrapped in, I'm an, a riddle wrapped in an enigma and cash. The bar wants more money. The state says no because you're not doing your job. The bar says in order to do our job, we need more money. The state's like, mm, I don't think so. You, you, your spending is not so kosher. Well, like I said, there was the whole reform that came in 2018. They cleaned house, got rid of, you know, Latin and done. Things got better-ish. More cases were being handled, but the strategy was to then tackle the smaller cases because they were easier to solve. And, it you know, it, it would be... So the they the reform came and the cases that were settled yes increased and the statistics look like they were getting better but if you actually look into those and again there's a whole article that dives deep into this on law 360 if you dig into those that's where you realize that their strategy was to go after the little cases the easy to solve cases because those were the ones that we can easily check off the books and you know be done with and settle and add that as another you know another number another tally on the, on the board whereas going after the big sharks like Tom Girardi Tom Girardi would fight back and try to sink your battleship. So if the state bar came after Tom Girardi, he would use all of his power and influence to try and shut down the investigation or to we see what he was doing with the discovery process. When clients would try to sue him, he would bury them in paperwork. He would play these little games. He would kind of sit back and laugh and sit with Kathy and be like, ha, 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 look at what I'm doing. I'm driving them crazy. And the state bar was like, we were afraid that like we wouldn't be able to handle a case like Tom Girardi's because Tom was too big to fight. And so, you know, he just went and said, sailed off into the sunset and then landed in the ding dong ditch and broke his ankle. But anyway, it's still a back and forth finger pointing between the California state and the California state bar. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's ultimately going to take the blame. The bar is still fighting for more money because they're like, okay, we're barely keeping up with the cases that we have that if you want us to take on someone like Tom Girardi, we're going to need a lot more money. And the state's a little iffy and they're trying to fight back. And it's really just a tug of war and a pointing of the fingers at this point. It's a pissing match. They're trying to figure out whose dick is bigger. And I'm just like, figure your shit out. People need their people are getting bamboozled. And I'm sure Tom Girardi isn't the only one that's screwing people over right now. So let's get it together. And this is why it's also like, you know, interesting that a lot of these lawyers also don't have their liability insurance for their firms or for their individual practices. And they're able to kind of continue to get away with this sort of thing. Messy, messy. All right, let's talk about Erica Jane's book, The Pretty Mess. So big, I took, I listened to the whole thing on Audible and I took a ton of notes. Backstory is that she had a rough childhood absentee parents. She had to grow up really fast. She was really close to her grandmother and she's been cold as ice since the beginning of time, essentially. You know, she talks about how she was very, you know, cold to her mother, refers to her as Renee, didn't really call her, didn't ever call her mom. She speaks very highly of Tom and how much she adored him for the life that he gave her. And I would imagine there is a lot of love there considering like 
she was a struggling actress. She was a waitress. She had a son that she had to provide for. So when, you know, a nice, rich lawyer comes to to save you and your kid, I would imagine you do have a, a deep appreciation and adoration for him. She says that Tom was the one that helped her file for her company, file her company, EJ Global, um, and that he would always give her a lot of business advice. Nothing new that we haven't already heard. It does get a little more incriminating the later you get into the book. Um, she claims that she, which I found interesting, that she has dated more powerful and more wealthy men than Tom, but that Tom was always very sweet, which was interesting. She also mentions back in the time when she was working at different um, like bars and restaurants and stuff that there was like a, a raid one time at a, I think she worked at a club and there was a place next door that ended up getting raided by the feds. And so I was like, Ooh, I wonder if that connects to the episode that we had recently where she was telling the women that she, you know, was part of a, a federal investigation and she had to wear wire. I would assume that like that, I mean, the two kind of connect. I don't know. But she says that, um, she says that she, that Tom really valued and respected her opinion and that she claims that he would ask for her thoughts or input on certain cases. Like when she would be waitressing, he would call her over before they were actually together. And he'd be like, hey, you know, what do you think of this? Or what do you feel of that? And I, I don't know if that's necessarily incriminating because they weren't actually together. And I highly doubt he would be, you know, just leaking incriminating information of his own. But I think it made her feel good. It made her feel important. And it was probably his attempt at like trying to pick her up being like, hey, hey, pretty lady, can you come over here? And, you know, I'm, I'm my man brain doesn't understand this law of terminology. So can you, Erica Jane, who's, you know, taking drink orders down there, can you come over here and help me with my case? Is it that incriminating? I don't know. Mm. When Tom married her, he, I found this interesting that when they got married, Tom requested that he did not have to wear a wedding ring. He's like, I don't wear wedding, wedding rings. I don't do wedding rings. I'm not going to wear one, which is also interesting and connects to like the cheating claims. Like, was this something that she knew going in? If he wasn't going to wear a wedding ring, does that mean she knew that he was likely going to be cheating on her? And was she okay with that? Because I mean, and there, and there was also no talk of the prenup. She said she was okay without having a prenup because Tom told her that there's always a way around a prenup anyway. That's kind of concerning to me if somebody's like, I'm not going to get a prenup because I'll win at the end of the day regardless. And if he tells you that up front, and then if he tells you he's not going to wear a wedding ring, but yet you still decide to go into this marriage, that's a little interesting and iffy. Um, she, t she claims that Tom was like her legal sounding board and that they did kind of talk law sometimes. And I know even in an interview she did a few years ago, like she talks about how very legally savvy she is. Now, again, does that mean she was keen to what he was actually doing and keen to the fact that he wasn't paying his clients? Not necessarily, but it does mean that, you know, as these lawsuits were coming up in recent years and as she was starting to ask about ask about them, that she was starting to potentially put these pieces together on her own. And again, who knows how savvy she actually was legally? I think in her head, she thinks she's really smart and really legally savvy. I don't know. Again, I think Tom learned his lesson with Kathy when Kathy burned him in court and he probably wasn't giving Erica all of the details or at least not anything that she could use against him. Or maybe he wasn't. Maybe I'm, I'm completely wrong. But she also clarifies, she says, I, I never involved myself in his business, never gave him unsolicited advice or involved myself in office politics with the other lawyers. So I don't So that's where it's kind of like, well, was he talking to you about his cases or were you not involved in his business? And again, this book was from a few years ago. I highly doubt this was part of like, you know, laying down the track works to, you know, they didn't know this was all going to blow up in 2020. I, I think it, it really got out of control and just blew up. And, you know, it really just got out of his hands. But I don't think she went into writing this book. She says too many, she says too many nice things about him and, you know, complimentary things about him for me to believe that she knew this was all going to come to a head at some point. And so this was part of a big mastermind plan to, you know, escape at the end. I don't think so. She says that she was his cheerleader and that really her role in his life or in his business, her role was to entertain the other wives and be charming to help him close his deals. That seems likely to me. Um, she does, however, write that their money is our money. 
because her name is on the tax returns too. And she says that in the book. And I think this, this is an actual incriminating piece, not necessarily against him cheating the cheating out his clients, but in the potential tax issues that I think are going to be coming down the line, which I talk about, we get into that stuff further and like what Erica's act, could potentially go to jail or prison for and like what she may be criminally responsible for. We get into all of that. And that's where this tax piece kind of comes into play. And that's where what her saying, you know, my name is on all the tax returns. That's where that's not going to look good for her down the line. But again, that'll come more in Wednesday's episode. She does subtly kind of talk about how she, you know, was really just in his shadow because of how powerful he was. And, you know, she didn't really... And again, these are little subtle things that she would mention outside of, you know, obviously a lot of the love and admiration for him that she shares in the book. These are just the little things that I caught on, obviously, with the context we have today that we, would have necess- we wouldn't have necessarily paid attention to back when the book first came out. She also refers to Tom as the boss and talks about how he would use her music career to, um, he would book gigs that he, for people, book Erica Jane gigs to perform for people that he needed to like influence or impress and that she didn't have a choice that she that in some instances she wouldn't even be given any the, any of the actual details about the performance she would just have to have her team there show up and perform he would book it and she really didn't have an option not to perform i think there was even a time where she was like i don't know if this is on brand for me i don't think if i sh- i should perform at this place and he told her like she didn't have any other option she had to perform So that kind of goes into like the power dynamic that they had. And then there was one other fun little tidbit in the book where she mentions having to perform or not having to, but she mentions a performance at a sex club, which is interesting. And then later in chapter 13, she talks about how she was working with a major music manager that told her she needed to pivot her career, which was right before she ended up joining Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, which she attributes as her pivot in her career. And I think this is really interesting because a few months ago or at the end of 2020, there were the rumors that she met Scooter Braun at a sex club and that they formerly had a fling together. She also admitted on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills that she did indeed know Scooter Braun, but that she hadn't talked to him in years. So maybe that's actually true. And she kind of sort of admitted that, like now all the pieces are coming together and maybe the sex club she performed at was where she met Scooter Braun. And maybe Scooter Braun was the one that was giving her advice because she says it was a really powerful, it was a major music uh, manager We know he manages Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande. So it's possible that like, I just thought that was like a fun little tidbit to throw in there that it's possible that they actually did have a a fling and it wasn't just a rumor. Who knows? And then there's Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and what she's actually claiming on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So, so far she's claiming to not know about the Boeing or not to not know about the Boeing. Oh, well, that's the weird part because she's saying I didn't know any of this stuff and it's really we're really getting a lot of this from like the trailers and the and the previews because we haven't really dove into that yet I guess when she's crying with Kyle and there's the mascara thing like she says like I didn't know and then in her confessional they asked her when she learned about the Boeing lawsuit and she's like I can't answer that so I think my what I think happened was she within the past two years when all of these lawsuits were starting to come up and she was starting to ask Tom questions and she was pushing it and pushing it and he was seemingly pushing her out and pushing her out and getting angry and snapping at her the same way we saw him snapping at his clients and the housewife and the hustler. I think that's when she was starting to look into things a little bit further and that's when she started to realize like I think I need to get out. And she was starting to build her her roadmap for getting out. And I think that probably happened maybe in 2019, but mostly in 2020. And I think those 11 months leading up to her divorce filing were really her exit strategy, especially when she had to stay at home with him and had to live with him. And then we see earlier in the season, in the, what was the first episode she talks about going on Lexapro and how you know it was really hard being at home all day with Tom. She said it was nice, but it was also challenging. And she you know was having mental health issues. So maybe there's something to that. We'll have to see as it continues to unfold. There's also the whole Tom losing his mind, which if you listen to what she said about the car accident in previous seasons, there's a scene with her talking to Mikey about the car accident. Um, and she kind of alluded to, but like really tiptoed around the po- the the fact that like it's possible that he was having cognitive decline, but like she tipped around it so much that like you don't really know if she's just saying that like he's getting old or if she's saying 
he's getting old and he's getting sick without trying to say that because obviously I don't think she wanted to fully say that on camera. Obviously, if that was something Tom was in denial about, putting it out there on the show, I think would cause a lot of additional anger and upset from Tom Girardi. So she's claiming to not really know anything. Part of me has some ounce of hope that as this is all continuing to break out, on the show or play out on the show that we will get a moment of acknowledgement for the victims. I think she owes them that. I think I talked to Emily D Baker about whether or not that incriminates her. Emily says that there's a way to do it that wouldn't incriminate her, that there's a way to address it. And I'm hoping that it does get addressed on housewives. Like there's a, a tiny little sliver that I do not for her sake, but for the victim's sake. Cause I feel like they deserve that more than her reputation deserves that at this point. But the book basically, the book, to wrap that up, the book basically says he had a lot of power, he had a lot of influence, he managed her career in a lot of different ways, but that she really did love him, she really did admire him, she really did think that he was a sweet man, she was very grateful to the life that he gave her. You know, she says a lot of really complimentary things about him in the book, Again, when it comes to his business, she does say that, you know, there were times when he would ask her for advice on certain cases, whether or not that was him just trying to stroke her ego or I don't know. I don't believe he was really giving her all of that insight now, knowing what what went down with his ex-wife, Kathy, and the way that she used that against him. I don't think he's a stupid man, and I don't think he would make that same mistake with his next wife. So I don't believe that Erica knew that much about his inner business dealings did he ask for her advice on certain cases probably um but like she said in the book and she admitted it in the book what how many four years ago she was arm candy her role was to sit there be polite entertain the wives and look pretty and perform for his friends when he needed her to perform for his friends that's that's what she gave us that's what she says you can read it yourselves if you want if you have a copy you can dig through it um Is it a little incriminating? Yes. The tax stuff, I think, is the most incriminating because she says, like, our money is our money and my name is on those tax tax returns as well. So, you know, whatever, whatever. Did she know? Is she guilty? I mean, I guess the bigger question that everybody has is, did she know? At the end of the day, I don't think it matters if she knew or not, to be honest. Was she the master manipulator? I don't think she was the master manipulator. Um, Is she likely now being used as the scapegoat? And um, is Tom pissed that she left him to rot? Probably. And I definitely think she's being used as a scapegoat because right now everyone's looking at Tom's money and they're trying to liquidate all the assets. She has a lot of assets that she's likely going to have to turn over at some point. We get into that a lot more in the Emily D. Baker interview that comes out this Wednesday. So I'll reserve some of that so that there's more, you know, you have something to look forward to this Wednesday. Um, But I don't think she's the master manipulator behind this plan because this whole plan was going on way before she jumped into the picture. And a lot of that information, like a lot of his lawsuits and all that stuff was never public. Um, It never came out. Kathy's divorce settlement um, and her testimony, that's not public information either. You have to actually go through the divorce documents and look into all of those, all of that paperwork in order to find it. But like, unless you're looking for something you're not really going to find anything. So I don't think Erica Jane would have actually found anything as this was all breaking back in the day. And again, it was breaking and disappearing. It wasn't actually coming to fruition. And over the years, Tom was continuing to buy covers of magazines, get all of these awards, being praised by the press, being praised by the state, you know, getting all of this recognition from other lawyers and judges like there was, I don't think there was any reason to believe that he was scamming anybody. He was really fighting off these lawsuits and influencing people and bullying his way through. Is Erica Jane cold as ice? Yes. Is Erica Jane tone deaf, especially on social media right now? Yes. Should she probably get off social media? Absolutely. Um, is she probably angry at Tom uh, and lashing out because she thinks she's a victim in this too? Probably. I think she does think she's a victim in this too. And she is, but not to the degree that other people have been victimized by Tom. Like, read the room, girl. But like, I get it. Like, you're now discovering that 20 years of your life could have were a lie and your money wasn't real and it's now blood money and you're realizing you flaunted that money and you, you know, all of these different things. Like, I think 
she yes, she's tone deaf, she's cold as ice, she probably thinks she's a victim, and that's why she has this like strong defense mechanism in this. Is she done with Tom? Most definitely. Did she benefit from Tom's alleged shady dealings? Yes. Did she benefit from the mo- the blood money that Tom brought in? Yes. Did she know where the money was coming from? Not likely. Did she have a hand in these dealings? Probably not. Should she have remorse for the victims? Absolutely. And then people, but it's, I know, I feel like there's just a lot of hatred there, you know? And I'm like, it's, it's a little unwarranted, you know? Okay, let's talk about Ronald Richards because this is also another like really intense, shady piece of all of this. And I think he's getting a lot of praise and he's getting a lot of love. And I just don't feel like it's warranted and we need to like chill with this, like, you know, eating out Ronald Richards. Cause I feel like Ronald Richards is no saint in all of this. He's doing some good. He is doing some good. He did cause a big reckoning on Twitter that got a lot of people's attention. He is giving information to the public that I think is valuable and important, but I think it's kind of getting away from him now. I had him on my show back a few months ago. I enjoyed, you know, what I learned from our conversation back in the day, but then I dug a little deeper into Ronald Richards and I'm not as impressed with him. First of all, his history with Taylor Armstrong. So he was Russell Armstrong, Taylor Armstrong's ex-husband. Remember season two when he committed suicide? Russell Armstrong was represented by Ronald Richards in their divorce, in his divorce against Taylor Armstrong. And so when I went back and looked into Ronald Richards and his representation of Russell, he claims that, like, I was looking, like, days after Russell committed suicide, Ronald Richards is out there claiming that Taylor was fame hungry. He's doing all sorts of interviews. Um, He says that Taylor was fame hungry and Russell was just trying to provide her with this lifestyle to keep her happy. And then at the end of the day, you know, she ends up leaving him anyway and then making up lies about domestic violence. Here are some of the quotes from Ronald Richards directly. This is from a 2011 interview with The Rap, days after Russell committed suicide. He worked hard to get where he worked hard to get her where she was. Who do you think paid for that lifestyle? If you don't, if you, and then he basically said, like Taylor owed Russell because he gave her this lifestyle, and how dare she just leave and then accuse him of domestic violence? Is basically the point he's trying to make. And then he says, if you drink too much with your wife, and one person goes bananas, and then you grab them and say stop. I didn't, I didn't think that was domestic violence. So this is Ronald Richards saying, he says, I thought that was just calming your spouse down. So this is him saying that he had seen Russell and Taylor get really drunk and fight, and then Russell would grab her and try to calm her down. And Ronald's like, well, him grabbing her is not domestic violence. That's just him grabbing her, downplaying their domestic violence. Then he also said, I think the specter of him being labeled as an abuser was really bothering to him because the only type of issues were excessive drinking and a little grabbing. He said that to Megyn Kelly also in 2011. He told TMZ, the photos of Taylor's abuse injuries were phony. He said that they were from pa- plastic surgery. He said that, you know, her her facial injuries were from plastic surgery and because she got hit in the face with a baseball. Um, it just... It's very misogynistic, and that kind of seems to be his pattern. I see him now trying to tear down the other housewives on Beverly Hills. Also very, to me, just problematic. Like, it's just very misogynistic, and he's very much about tearing down and coming after women and just seeing him. Like, now he's, like, coming after Lisa Renna, and I'm just like, there's. I already looked into, like, the potential Erica, you know, possibly giving Lisa Renna or helping Lisa Renna invest in her Renna Beauty business. Not true. From what I found, there's no crumbs that link to that. Um, I don't think that that rumor is true. I think that's like an LVP stand theory. Um, he's saying that Lisa Rin is shady because she has a mortgage and because she's being sued right now, which if you look into the lawsuit, it's a paparazzi that's suing her for posting pictures on her Instagram account that the paparazzi took of her. It, that's a common celebrity lawsuit. It's basically a paparazzi trying to, it's a fishing. It, he's fishing for money at that point from a celeb. Not that deep. And also, you know, like when it comes to the interviews that Ronald was doing about Russell, like, yes, Taylor was also, to be fair, like Taylor was also doing multiple interviews at that time as well. But for Ronald to kind of be, for him to tear her down, for him to downplay the abuse, I just, I don't like that. I don't like the way that he always goes after women. I don't like how culturally we love to tear down women more than we love to hold men accountable. 
you know, I've recently last week had a personal experience with Ronald Richards that really kind of tainted my experience with him and really made me think he's a lot shadier than I wanted to believe that he was at the beginning. Other clients have reached out to me and shared their experiences. I won't get into all of those. I won't even talk about my personal experience, but I'll just say like my, my opinion of him has changed from what I've heard and not just what I've heard, but from my own personal experience. And I think he's a really shady dude. I think he's doing some good work by exposing Tom Girardi, but like we can't pretend he's a total saint when he has 40% of what he recovers. Like he has like about 10, around $10 million to benefit from this case to walk away from if he's successful in this case, he will walk away with $10 million on top of his expenses being covered at the end of the day. On top of the exposure that he's gaining, the fans that are coming after me, like it's not, he's not a saint. He's no angel. We need to stop praising this man that's not very respectful of women. He is doing a job. He's doing a good job. But there are many other people that are involved in the investigation that aren't ranting on Twitter, that aren't trying to tear anybody down. And that's just where I stand with that. (sighs) All right. So what happens now? What happens to all the victims? What happens to all the people that are owed money? That's kind of the biggest million dollar question right there is what's the next step? I mean, this isn't over for a long shot. Like we have a long way to go before there's going to be any sort of closure. Right now, the trustee, there are multiple lawsuits that are going on within the bankruptcy and the trustee is trying to get as many different assets as she can. We have Ronald Richards and other investigators that are now that are now part of this. They are suing Erica Jane, which we'll get more into in my episode with Emily D. Baker this Wednesday. She is being sued twice within the bankruptcy. And it gets into the like what she could possibly be culpable for, what she may have to pay up. The theory that it looks like she's going with or the um, strategy that it looks like her and her legal team are going with, the reason it looks like she's holding on to everything is so that she can kind of build this little bank and build this mountain of assets that are probably going to end up being pulled in and given up as community property because they were assets that she had. What I think is happening is she realizes that the past 20 years of her life were funded on blood money. So she's building this pile. Again, this is just my theory. I could be wrong, but this is kind of what I'm assuming based off of what I've seen, what I've read, what I've heard. It looks like she's building up this bank of like all of this, all of these assets. You have the Panther ring, you have the, um, all the other jewelry and gifts that Tom gave her. That's a really big thing. Or is the gifts argument? What does that actually mean? Is she going to be, um, trying to really fight for that. I mean, is she really fighting over a Panther ring and a piece of the house money for herself? It looks like she's building it so that because she knows that at the end of the day, she's going to have to pay up a lot of money. And instead of paying out of pocket from her housewife's money or from her personal income, she's going to try to pay it with the community property assets. So the jewelry, the expensive handbags, the piece of the house that she's trying to fight for, it looks like she's building that little mountain of what she's accumulated over the past 20 years, which I think is actually kind of a smart strategy given the circumstances. So I know it looks really bad of like, why isn't she just handing over the jewelry? Why isn't she just handing over the money? I think the legal strategy is that her team's like, you're going to have to pay up in the end Let's just build up this account of everything that we can throw in the pot at this point. Everything that you basically accumulated over these past 20 years that was made with blood money, that money needs to go to these people that are owed money. I think the priority should be focused on the victims and not necessarily the lenders. I know some of the lenders, from what I hear, are willing to kind of negotiate and they'll take a little bit of money versus everything that Tom owed them versus all of the interest that Tom accumulated on some of those loans. They just want something from it at this point. The house continues to get devalued. It continues to, the price continues to go down. We have his office buildings that were sold, but apparently he has a lot more real estate and property down Wilshire aside from just his office buildings that could also be liquidated as well. I know that's kind of being investigated and seen where a lot of this money is hidden. It looks like the money could possibly be hidden in property. Um, We heard on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Erica talked about how Tom 
said that a, a good way to hide money is through really expensive artwork. So I think the money exists. It's just hidden in these different places. And hopefully all of those assets can get liquidated so that these people can start to get paid back the money that they're owed. But again, this is where it gets a little a little messy because I learned about the two types of loans. There's a secured loan and there's an unsecured loan. And so basically an unsecured loan means you're out of luck. And it basically says that you don't have any collateral attached to that loan. You don't have any liens attached to that loan. So when it comes to the victims that were owed money from Tom, most of them don't have a secured loan. Most of them are, this is money he was supposed to give us that he didn't give us. Whereas like with the lenders, and this is where you see these documents that Erica Jane allegedly signed, which are not notarized, which is really key, and they can possibly just be thrown out altogether. I keep seeing them circulate on Instagram, and I keep trying to tell people they don't actually mean anything, and they're probably not going to be upheld in anything. And what does it mean in terms of like her, what she knew? It means that she knew that Tom was taking out a loan. It doesn't mean that she knew that he... I mean, if you knew that he was ripping off orphans and widows, does it even make sense that your husband would be, t would be taking out a loan at that point? Like, I don't think, again, I, I really don't think she knew as much as, as we want her, as we want to believe that she actually knew. Again, she just knew that he was possibly taking out some loans. And she basically said, you know, I understand these assets that he's putting up as collateral. The lenders can, can come for them if Tom were to pass away. I'm not, I'm going to relinquish, you know, I'll make sure you guys get paid before I get anything out of this divorce. And like, we have heard her talk about the prenup and how they don't have a prenup, but he kind of had it set up to where if she were to walk away, she probably wouldn't end up with anything. So though that paperwork really kind of just doesn't really mean much, but a lot of these lenders, when you take out a loan, they're really smart and they make you put up, you know, I mean, just bringing it down to like the average person. If you go to the bank and you take out a loan, usually you have a cosigner, you have collateral that you put up against the loan. So there are those assets that Tom said, the issue is like with the house, he put the house up for collateral on multiple loans, which you can't do. So he was technically lying to these lenders saying, oh yeah, you can use my house as collateral. But he did that to more than one lender. And you, you typically can't do that and how he was even able to get away with that. I'm sure there were other loopholes within the lending system that he was able to to work through. But basically, long story short, what can the victims do now? Unless they were like the Rui Gomez family who was really smart about all of this that really got ripped off, but they were sharks and they kind of kept coming after Tom Girardi and they went to the judge and they had liens put against some of his property and his assets so that they could secure their loan. And so if your loan has been secured and there is a lien attached to it, then you're entitled to that property. The issue though, again, becomes he had multiple liens attached to the same assets that now it becomes a fight of like, well, who then gets that asset? So like the house, for example, who then gets the liquidated ass the liquidated money from the house if he promised multiple people that money? That kind of becomes the issue at this point. But it looks like from the victims, the Rui Gomez family is probably one of the very few that will end up, one, at the, at the front of the line, but it's, again, because they've been fighting him in court for many years to get their money. The other families, I don't think were as, um, as savvy. I mean, I feel kind of shitty saying that, but it's like, can we blame them for not being savvy? Like, you trusted this lawyer who said that he got your back. He won you this big settlement, but now you don't have the financial documents. You don't know what the actual details of the settlement were. It's hard to sue him. You're trying to settle with him because he's telling you he's a good guy. Like it gets really, really unfortunate and messy. So one of my big, biggest questions was, okay, well, if all of his assets are being liquidated and you have all these people that are fighting for what's left of it, it's going to take a while before we realize the value in assets that Erica Girardi has. And, you know, once she turns all of those over, which I believe at some point she's going to want, you're not going to want to keep a blood money panther ring. Like, and that's just one of the many assets that she's currently uh, seemingly in possession of. But like, I feel like at the end of the day, she's going to be like, here, just take it. I don't want anything to do with it. I will go off and make my own money elsewhere and do my own thing. At least that's what I hope. I don't know if that's actually going to happen. I can see that happening and I hope that's what happens. We'll see. We'll see how that all shakes out. But all of that, all of those assets are all being fought over by multiple lenders and other clients that Tom Girardi had ripped off, allegedly. And so 
what I think or what I my next thought was like, okay, well, the state bar is the one that really screwed all of this up. And the state of California was the one that should have been regulating the state bar who should have been regulating these lawyers. So that's where the attention should go, because they should be the one to the ones to fork out this cash. If a lot of these clients were getting ripped off, because they're the ones that had the responsibility to check lawyers like Tom Girardi. Obviously, now they're pointing the finger back and forth, the state versus the bar. Um, who knows how that'll end up all shaking out. It looks like at this point, everybody's just trying to cover their ass. And people were willing to turn the other cheek, whether it was because they had close relationships with Tom, whether it was because Tom was bankrolling their campaigns, or whether it was because there just really wasn't enough resources to be able to take on someone like Tom Girardi that was very smart, that did know how to beat the system, that did know how to play people in the system, that was very intimidating, that was sleeping with judges and buying their plastic surgery, like we saw with Trisha A. Bigelow, who Erica exposed on her Instagram account. All that's alleged, but, you know, it's not looking pretty. And so my thing was like, okay, well, why don't you why don't the victims get together and file a class action lawsuit against the state or against the bar? Well, looking into that, the bar only has 8 million total budgeted that they have budgeted for payouts that go to victims of lawyer theft. So when your lawyer steals your settlement or more than they were entitled to in the settlement, that's when you can then go to the state bar and be like, this lawyer ripped me off. I need, you know, this is the money that I'm entitled to that I never got. And then they have $8 million budgeted that they can then give to that, the clients, for the money that was stolen. However, there's a lot more than $8 million that Tom Girardi owes to these people. I'm pretty sure there is a lawyer, maybe a team of lawyers, possibly a couple of law firms that are trying to strategize what the best way to get the money is. Because at this point, it looks like if you're just starting to jump in line right now to go after Tom Girardi or Erica Jane, you're probably, you're way at the back of the line that you're probably not going to end up getting anything from them. But at least if you go, I mean, I think if you sued the bar or the state, at least you have somewhat of a chance. And it seems like that's an annual budget of $8 million. Maybe that'll... I mean, it seems like people that try to fight don't really get as much. Um, it's not like one person's going to walk in and get that full $8 because obviously they try to break it up for multiple cases. I mean, it may even be a question of can the California, the state of California, can they up that budget for the state bar so that all of these people can get the money that they're owed because neither of them were doing their job correctly? We'll have to see. But at this point, it looks like a lot of these people are going to be SOL. And they're probably not going to get the money that they were entitled to, if anything, at this point. And again, the lawyers, I mean, sorry, not the lawyers, the lenders and the the people that were giving Tom Girardi these loans, they're the ones that are at the front of the line because they were the ones that were, you know, one, have the resources, two, have the savvy to know how to file against Tom, and three, are the ones that jumped ahead of the game and have the secured loans, whereas a lot of the clients are just... It's going to be really, really challenging and tricky for them. And I hope people find some sort of peace through all of this. And I hope there is a way to dig up more assets that we can we can get out to the people that are owed money because this is really, really bad. So in conclusion, after this deep dive part two, we should definitely be mad at Tom Girardi. I see a lot of anger. I see a lot of hatred towards Erica Jane, Erica Girardi. That's not to say that it's unwarranted. I mean, yeah, she's an ice queen. Can she a bit can she be a bitch? Sure. Is she cold as ice? Yeah. Is she a riddle wrapped in an is she an enigma wrapped in a riddle in cash? Absolutely. We are still trying to figure her out. Is it possible that she's fake crying or not fake crying, but playing up, you know, the emotion or the tears on the show? That's very possible. I mean, we have to also factor in that like her life is literally imploding as this is being filmed that it's like, is she really, you know, stone cold to the point where she doesn't care and she's just fake performing on the show. And she really is like sitting at home be like, ha 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 ha. I have all this money from the orphans and widows. Probably not. Like, think about it. Like I try to be like, well, if I were in that situation, I would probably be 
crying as much as I can or just doing whatever I can, being like, I'm not guilty. And holy shit, my husband duped me and now is leaving me on the hook to have to pay all of this. Because right now, the bar can't even go after Tom Girardi with criminal charges because he can't prosecute a lawyer that's mentally incapacitated. So if the dementia and Alzheimer's actually sticks... That's not looking good for them going after Tom. There are probably going to be no criminal charges filed against him because, again, you can't go after a lawyer that's mentally incapacitated. There's At that point, they're like, oh, well, I guess there's nothing left to do. And I think Tom Girardi, being the smart man that he actually is, probably knew that. Not saying he's faking his dementia, not saying it's pretend amnesia, but I'm just saying it's very convenient. It's possible. I mean, we see that he drove into the ding-dong ditch, but like, I don't, there's still so many questions and so many pieces that are floating up in the air, but I definitely think we need to be more upset at Tom Girardi. We need to be more upset at the system that failed these clients. We need to be upset at this law firm. I think we need to look at the other lawyers and the partners that were a part of this law firm. Obviously, that was the business. You can't really hold the wife accountable for what was going on in the husband's business when it's not her responsibility to be a part of the business. And she was her name isn't on Girardi Keys. She's not a partner there. She's not a lawyer there. You know, there are many things that we can hold Erica accountable for. This scheme was going on long before her. And I'm sure after she left, he would have continued to rip people off because he did it for as long as he could. And he got as much as he could out of it. Did she benefit off of this money? Absolutely. Is that terrible? Absolutely. Should she turn over the assets and and acknowledge the victims? Absolutely. Do I think that that'll happen? Probably, but she's in multiple lawsuits right now and people are coming for her in the court system that it's not looking good for her. And I think she has to really play her card smart. And I mean, I have hope that there's a little bit of of warmth in that ice heart of hers and that she will at some point show some sort of compassion to the victims if she hasn't already. We don't know how this is all going to play out on Housewives. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I wish she would get off Twitter. Like as much as I get pissed about Ronald Richards and all of his crazy tweets, Erica Jane's Twitter is not that much better. Like, let's be clear. I'm not trying to fully defend her. Like, I think you know, I get it. You feel like a victim and you feel like your life is imploding in front of you. And it is. And it's imploding in front of all of us. I get that. But I think a lot of our anger should be directed at the system that failed the clients and the man that committed all of these for what, three decades, more than three decades. We don't even know if it goes even deeper than that. But like at this point, We need to like not just continue to prosecute and rip apart a woman that we really don't know was fully culpable. Tom Girardi, we have voicemails of him telling the clients, I'm a good guy, and then yelling at them and snapping at them and getting angry at them and then threatening them in court and then laughing about the way he was abusing the court system. We have the receipts. We have the voicemails. We have the case studies. We have the former clients. We don't have all of that against Erica Jane. So Why are we giving a shit about whether or not her mascara was waterproof intentionally or not waterproof? Like, what is that conversation even about? Like, in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of the grand scheme, Erica Jane does not really matter. The only thing she really matters for at this point is turning over the money that or the assets that were probably community property amongst within their marriage and not actually her personal property or her gifts. It's it's complicated. I don't think she's innocent. I think she needs to acknowledge the victims. I hope that we get some sort of acknowledgement either on Housewives or at the reunion or in a tell-all sit-down interview. Andy Cohen's probably going to be gunning for that. I'm pretty sure all the other, you know, Megyn Kelly's not getting that interview. She may have got the Ronald Richards interview back in 2011, but she's not getting anything else. I also think we need to not, like, praise men like Ronald Richards. Is he doing a job? Yes. Is he bringing justice to the families that are owed money, that's a little iffy. He's likely going to be walking away with more money than they'll be getting. Like, that's the reality. That's the honest truth, is he's probably going to walk away with more money, his assets co- or his expenses covered, his fees paid, and his his commission in the bank. On top of all of the people that are supporting him on Twitter, giving him this platform, all of the interviews that he continues to do while being a part of this investigation, there are other investigators, there are other lawyers that are digging into all of this that we don't hear about. Alyssa Miller, 
I mean, we kind of hear about her a little bit, but like she's the trustee. We know of the trustee, but we don't see the trustee doing interviews and, you know, trying to gain clout or tweeting up a storm or trying to go after the other housewives because they're hashtag mean girls, hashtag justice for Camille, hashtag, you know, whatever the hell the, the, the hell else is going on on Twitter right now. They're not looking for the clout. You know, yes, they're going to get their paycheck. And like, yes, they're entitled to their paycheck. They're doing a job and they're doing an investigation that's important that needs to be handled. I don't think we need to be praising misogynistic men like Ronald Richards. It's my personal opinion. Don't come for me. You're going to come for me anyway. A lot of you come for me in the comments. You come for me in the DMs. I just swipe left and keep going. I've done the deep dives. I've read it all. I've looked into it. I've talked to all the experts. I've analyzed the case from multiple different angles. I've looked at the show from multiple different angles. You know, we have to add context to a lot of these situations. And I think, you know, none of these people are great people. None of these people are innocent people. None of these people are free from their own skeletons in their closets. You know, let's be clear. I'm not trying to defend Erica Jane. But I also think a lot of that anger and hatred needs needs to be directed toward the man that actually had the responsibility to the clients that he ended up taking money from. Allegedly, even though it doesn't seem so alleged, but, you know, it's still alleged. Everybody's innocent until proven guilty. And yeah, like, stop. Like, is Ronald Richards a cool dude for, you know, trying to take down the big giant guests? Is he doing it for the victims? Probably not. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's a fraction of it but I'm pretty sure that fraction in comparison to what he has to gain is a lot, a lot more. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And like, look, at the end of the day, Tom Girardi is our focus. The bar needs to clean up their shit. The state of California needs to clean up their shit. I also look at like, what about all the judges that he apparently had close relationships with or was allegedly having affairs with? What about the California governor? That's a really big smoking gun right there. The fact that Tom Girardi was contributing a lot of money. Like we know Tom Latin and we know, what was it, Joe Dunn? We know about them and he was helping. He had very close relationships with them at the state bar. But like that goes bigger. When you have the California governor, Gavin Newsom, on Watch What Happens Live, praising Tom Girardi and Erica Jane, calling her his favorite housewife because her husband contributes so much money to his campaign, and then he's at the state of California that's now trying to clean up this mess with this scheme that's been going on for a lot of time. I'm not accusing Newsom of anything. I'm just saying it's very convenient. And there are a lot of these too many convenient truths. Those are the people we need to focus more of our attention on. We need to be looking at them. We need to be calling them out. We need to be holding them accountable. And we need to stop. Like, it's an it's the easier target. And I get it. That's our culture. Let's tear down women. It's funny. I was just watching this uh, interview that Britney Spears did back in the day when she was younger. And she when the, her Hit Me Baby One More Time video came out. And she was showing a little bit of tummy. And everyone's like, oh, my God, she's showing her stomach. What a slut. And then, and yet, yeah, and she was in the interview and she's like, I don't get why nobody's talking about Backstreet Boys and NSYNC that are also doing these very risque music videos, but it's because they're men and we like to give men a pass and we don't like to hold men as accountable as we do women. For whatever reason that is, I don't know. I think it goes, you know, way deeper into this misogynistic culture that we've bred and been raised in. But I think at some point we need to kind of tune the dial and focus our attention elsewhere. And not get so caught up in the details of a reality show. It's fun. We love to watch Housewives and we love to kind of watch it all get down. I mean, there's also a difference like Jen Shaw. I don't believe Jen Shaw is that innocent. I don't believe she, like she's coming out and she's like, I'm fully innocent. And you see that the feds have been investigating her for many, many years. Whole different situation. That's a federal investigation with criminal charges that have been filed. Erica Jane's likely not going to be charged with any criminal uh she's likely not going to be charged criminally because I don't think they can actually pin her for anything. That's my honest feedback. And that's, again, call me naive, call me dumb, call me stupid, whatever you want to call me. I did a lot of digging and I, I'm going to flex it right now. I did a lot more digging than a lot of the, the people in the comments. And if, just because you like Lisa Vanderpump or you dislike Erica Jane, I'm not a big Erica Jane fan. I didn't even really like she was cool. Yeah, it was fun to kind of watch her. But like I wasn't an Erica Jane stan. Just saying, guys, let's really hold the people that need to be held accountable. Accountable. 
Thank you guys for listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. You can give me a follow at Just Plain Zach and follow the show at No Filter with Zach. Be sure to get my new rosé, Housewives Inspired, four fun cans, one light crisp rosé. Each of the cans is designed with... Uh, I designed them with some of the most iconic Housewives moments in mind. It's delicious. It's perfect for summer. 12.8% alcohol, so you're going to get Liddy City, but less than a gram of sugar. So grab yours at nofilterwine.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, be sure to hit that follow button so that you're always up to date with the newest episodes. If you're listening to this on iTunes, please leave me a review, preferably a five-star review with some good positive, or not positive, but like critiques, or not critiques, but like examples of what you enjoy about the show. I think those reviews are really, really helpful. If you're watching this on YouTube, let me know what you think in the comments below. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and that bell notification button so that you're always getting the notifications when there's some new tea for me to spill. All right, guys, like I said, you can follow me at Just Plain Zach or follow the show at No Filter with Zach and get ready. Emily D. Baker is on the show this Wednesday and she's answering all of our biggest burning legal follow-up questions. Get ready. It's good.